Greetings YouTube. As I've said in the past, I have a fascination for books that have an extremely tightly focused topic. I have books on uh, cod, on the color mauve, on salt. The ele I have a book on the element of potassium. I have one that deals with bookshelves. I'm not quite sure why these books fascinate me so much, but they do. And the latest book I have read, Caviar, um, The Strange History and Uncertain Future of the World's Most Coveted Delicacy by Inga Saffron. And that made me smile when I noticed that the author's name is a, um, an herb and she was discussing um, food. Just, I thought that was interesting. So this book doesn't just cover the acquisition and consumption of caviar. It discusses the entire evolution of sturgeon, the impact that the fish has had on the economies of Russia, Iran, the United States. It deals with the development of caviar, how it was developed um, from a, um, uh, a substance that for the most part many people threw away. They, they would just toss the eggs of the sturgeon to their pigs. Um, or it would be considered food for um, slaves or, or the underclass. Um, and it wasn't until people began to process the eggs with salt in the, in the proper manner to preserve them and to give them flavor that uh, people really began to appreciate caviar as a food in and of itself. Now interestingly, I, and I wasn't aware of this, there are, there are basically three main means of consuming caviar as far as the actual processing. There is a low salt variety, which is about a 4% salt um, solution. Um, and that is the most common available of caviar today in today's world. And there's a higher salt caviar, which is about 8%, which was more common in the past because of uh, the lack of the ability to preserve them well. And, uh, and that is probably one of the reasons that a lot of people have, or at least in the past, had an impression that caviar was a very salty food because it was such a high content of salt. And there's another process where they actually take these, take the, uh, the, the caviar and they press it into little cakes so it can actually be sliced like, um, like cheese can. And uh, I, apparently some people still have an affection for that particular um, variety, but it's much rarer than the others. Um, and the, the, the book deals with the precipitous drop in sturgeon populations, because we have a very accurate measure of the uh, sturgeon populations over time. And you can just see these population numbers plummet. It's, it's mind-blowing. And as far as the European, yeah, the Western European rivers in the United States, sturgeon are no longer a commercial fish, flat out. They just don't exist. We have wiped them out to the point where, while they're not completely extinct, they are now only taken by sports fishermen and they can't um, sell the row. They're not allowed to do that. Though I guess if they wanted to make their own caviar out of it, they could, if they knew how to do it. Um, and in the United States, at least, they're starting to process um, paddle fish row and some other a number of other fish to make an American style caviar which I, I guess is being well received in some markets which I thought was kind of interesting but really the only place in the world where the sturgeon are left in any commercial numbers are, is the Caspian Sea and the rivers that feed the Caspian Sea because sturgeon are fish that go up river to spawn and go back river down back down the river to the ocean and it's a fish that has a life cycle where it can go up that river and down that river multiple times. And like, for example, the salmon, which is a one-way trip. They go back up that river to spawn, they don't ever come back, they die. Well, the sturgeon don't do that. And old sturgeon, which there are no such things any longer as old sturgeon, um, but the old sturgeon in the, in the past, they could be monstrous animals, like, like a thousand pounds, more than a thousand pounds, huge fish. Um, and unfortunately, to harvest the roe from a female sturgeon, you have to kill them. 
there is a Russian researcher who's been doing some processes where they milk the surgeon, but that's going to be a long time coming before it becomes any kind of standardization. So killing the fish is the method of harvest. Um, there has been some successful work both in the Russian area and uh, Russian and India, uh, Iranian uh, markets and in America with fish farming. Though the Russian and Iranian fish farming is pretty much reseeding, putting animals back into the wild so that they can then um, feed, grow, and become harvestable. Whereas they were doing here in America, they've been actually doing full fledged fish farming of sturgeon. But because of the limitations of fish farming, you can't have the size bodies of water that sturgeon would really need to get huge and sturgeon take a long time to get big. Um, they get into like the 80 pound range, which is still a big bloody fish. Um, and they've selectively bred them so that instead of taking 15 or 20 years to get to the point where they can start, they can be harvested in the wild, they are going to down to like 8 or 10 years in America in these fish farms. So it may be a point in the future where fish farming becomes um, the only readily available source of sturgeon because the ones in the wild are being harvested and poached to a degree that you would just not believe. There are poachers everywhere. There is a massive underground smuggling um, uh, uh, network. The Russian mafia is involved. I mean, it's nasty. And this book covers all of it. It's a fascinating read. It covers every facet you can think of when it comes to caviar, from the experts to the cooks that are doing things with it that are interesting, to the connoisseurs, to the owners of the stores, the companies that have gone out of business, the Russian market that crashed and has been taken over by you know the poachers, the Soviet era, which is looked back upon as a positive time because the Soviets knew what they had and they controlled it with an iron fist and they used their their caviar market um, to bring hard currency into the Soviet Union. Um, it's, this is a fascinating read and I'm, I'm definitely keeping this book. It's going to go on my shelf along with my other rather strange, uh, very single topic books that I love so much. Um, and apparently um, Mandarin has decided that she's going to join us today. She is. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this um, book review, and I suggest that if you have any interest in, in uh, sturgeon or caviar or just a kind of a quirky story, check it out.